Good evening. Thanks very much for your welcome, Bob. Thank you for coming and being here. I have to say it's quite remarkable the lengths to which you folk have gone to make this visit very special. I mean, to lay on the coldest night that you have had for umpteen years uh, for the evening that Moya and I arrived, that was special. To link it with the clear blue skies, bright sunshine, glistening snow, such as we've not seen in England for years, that was special. To herald my lecture last night with a complete blackout, <laughs> well, that was special too. But to enable the Blue Jays to win the World Series, you don't know how special that is. On the occasion when Moore and I were able to uh, go with Grace and Bob to that tremendous record-breaking match when the Blue Jays beat the New York Yankees and we were part of the record-breaking crowd, I was actually in Canada for a special engagement at McMaster. And the Blue Jays went on to lose the World Series that year. Do you remember? Now, this year, you've invited me to Acadia and the Blue Jays. Now, that's special treatment, to get them to win the World Series, ready for when I come. That really is special. Thank you. Will you lend me your mind's eyes and let me show you a little bit of heaven? My home county, Northamptonshire. It's a lovely, sunny afternoon, and the sun brings out the warmth of the sandstone with which the little school chapel in Moulton is built. Inside, it's the geography lesson, and up on the wall is a map of the world as it was then known. The odd-looking teacher, small in stature and with his wig that never seems to stay in place, is telling the children about the folk who live thousands of miles away from England. Even as he talks about those millions of people, particularly those in the South Sea Islands and Asia, those about which he'd heard so much by reading the writings of Captain Cook, the children are surprised and somewhat embarrassed to see that his eyes fill with tears. He thinks of those folk without a knowledge of God's love and in his view lost in their paganism. And the young William Carey, even before he became a pioneer missionary, wept for those folk. He could only think of the people around the world with respect and love because he saw them as God's much-loved children. And without their knowledge of God's love, he could only weep for their condition. Now, one of the biographers of William Carey reckons that that particular episode, which is recounted by S. Pierce Carey in his classic biography of William, the other biographer reckons that that's overly sentimental and not true to life and not true to William. Well, I'm not so sure. When you read of the passion and the concern of that man, William Carey, is it out of countenance and court? When I was in ministry in rugby, it was just down the road from the great city of Coventry. And while I was there, there came the special anniversary of the appalling bombing of the city of Coventry, when in one night it was blitzed and the centre of the city was wiped out. The cathedral devastated, much of the shopping centre devastated. Homes destroyed, businesses lost, people killed, lives wrecked and marred. The morning of the next day, King George VI went to Coventry. The local dignitaries took him around the city and they showed him something of the devastation. Eventually, towards the end of the day, when he'd seen so much and shared in meeting with the officials, he was being driven out of the city. There weren't many cars about that day, certainly not the special car that the king would drive in. And one of the women folk from Coventry saw the car and recognised that it would be the king. And she bent down and waved to him. And you know the royal family acknowledged the wave of the people and he didn't move. 
and she was quite hurt. But then as the car actually went by, she could see that he wouldn't even have known she was waving, for his eyes were filled with tears, and the king was weeping for his people. Now, I don't know about William Carey. I do know the validity of that story of the king. But if the king could weep for his people who had suffered, I'm quite certain that Carey could and did weep, whether physically or continually, for the folk whom he loved so much. If we picked up yesterday that one of the key factors in Carey's commitment to mission and his undertaking of the tasks of mission was his clear grasp of God's word as the word of life, so we have to say that another key factor is his love and concern and respect for all peoples. Listen to what he says in that famous book, The Enquiry. After all, the uncivilized state of the heathen, instead of affording an objection against preaching the gospel to them, ought to furnish an argument for it. Can we as men or as Christians hear that a great part of our fellow creatures whose souls are as immortal as ours and who are as capable as ourselves of adorning the gospel and contributing by their preaching, writings or practices to the glory of our Redeemer's name and the good of the church are enveloped in ignorance and barbarism, can we hear that they are without the gospel, without government, without laws and without arts and sciences and not exert ourselves to introduce them to the sentiments of men and of Christians? Carey cared for people. And this concern that he had led to a respect and a concern for their culture. When William Carey arrived in India, he wasn't content just to learn the language of the people. He set about understanding their culture, their whole way of life. He recognized that different though they were, they had a rich heritage of language and music, their history, their art, their literature, their customs and so on. His encounter with what was a totally alien culture didn't lead him to take an approach of antagonism or denigration but rather of respect and learning. We see this in his approach to the languages of India. As early as 1795, when he'd gone and taken up that post as manager of the indigo factory in Mudnabati, he began to learn the language Sanskrit, spending as much as one third of each day studying that language. Now, Sanskrit was special. It was India's status symbol. It was described by some as the criterion of the aristocracy. It was the learned and the wealthy, the upper caste who used Sanskrit. It was the, the special language. All the classics were in this sacred language. It was the queen of the dialects. For Indians, this was the language of heaven. Now, of course, within Britain we know all about the language of heaven. Well, yes, I mean, you, you've heard the story of the, uh, the senior official in the Cardiff Council who was walking through one of the parks in Cardiff in Wales and he saw a tramp-like character sitting on one of the park benches and he went up and he was going to move him along and he saw that, in fact, this tramp-like character was reading. And he said, what are you reading, my man? I'm learning the Welsh language, sir. The Welsh language... Yes, I've lived in this southern part of Wales for years and I cannot speak the Welsh language, so I'm learning it while I have time. While you have time? I want to learn the language of heaven, sir. <laughs> the language of heaven, said this official, looking at the tramp. But supposing you go to the other place? <laughs> I can already speak English, sir. <laughs> For the Indian peoples, Sanskrit was the language of heaven. And William Carey gave himself to it as a special study. 
And many of you will know that, uh, as well as mastering Bengali, he so much mastered Sanskrit that when later he was employed as a professor of languages at the, the college, he in fact became professor initially of Bengali, but became ultimately the professor of Sanskrit. And he was used um, throughout India and through the educational system there. By 1796, he could write to his friend John Ryland that he had read a considerable part of the Mahabharata, an epic poem, in most beautiful language and much on a par with Homer. Later, Carey and others in Serampore were to publish that epic as a piece of the great literature of India. Carey, as I say, went on to use his Sanskrit at Fort William College. And all the time he maintained that language and culture were precious. They were not to be despised nor discarded. What we see in the, the lessons that he tried to learn, we discover just as much in the way in which the College of Serampore was founded. Quite deliberately, it had an open basis. The Serampore trio did not establish a closed Christian community. The aim was that the college should be, and I quote, for the instruction of Asiatic, Christian and other youth in Eastern literature and European science. It was to equip young people in their own language and culture and tradition within India as well, of course, as to possess a theological department and so train students to be leaders of the Christian church throughout India. Carey's commitment to the Indian language and culture, the openness of the foundation of Serampore, all of this didn't please the folk who were back in Britain on the Home Committee. But Carey persisted in his approach. He believed that faith and mission must be culture-sensitive. For he didn't think that the differences in cultures are accidental or just the result of the sinful division of humankind. We know and we talk about the multicolored grace of God. By his approach and what he said, Carey is asking us to recognize the multicolored gifting of God to women and men. Culture isn't an accident. The different heritages that we have, the different languages that we use, don't let's be confused by the image of Babel into thinking that this is totally against the will of God. Language has a beauty and a flow and a rhythm and a music of its own. It's part of God's gifting. When we had part of our special BMS Bicentenary celebrations in Wales. We had a marvellous family day at Flanelweth, the Royal National Showground in the heart of Wales. And during that day we had services of worship, we had seminars, we had interviews, we had a whole range of activities. And throughout the day we used both languages, English and Welsh and the Welsh on whose home ground we were were content that those of us who had come in from overseas or at least from over the border were able to have our English language used. But it was right that we respected each other and we were able to use both languages because each is a gift and each has its own spo special quality and beauty. The respect for culture and heritage and language that we see in Carey is pointing us to something that is God-given. I must make clear that what I'm saying here is referring to culture. I'm not talking about people's religious beliefs. There may be a link between faith and culture, but it's not inevitable. Culture isn't the same as faith. It's not the same as the, the bottom line belief that folk have. That bottom line belief by which they're ready to live and die. People within the same culture can have quite different bottom line beliefs. 
To recognise culture, though, itself is crucial. And to ignore it can be offensive and be the cause of being distanced from the very people whom we seek to serve in mission. Let's stop and see if we can uh, take an example of that. I wonder if I could have a, a volunteer, please. A volunteer? A volunteer is better than any number of press men. Come on, come and join me. Thank you very much indeed. You don't mind if we leave you, do you? <laughs> Our kind and daring friend is going to come visit me in my home and bring a little gift. What she's not aware of is the fact that, at least for the purpose of this exercise, I'm living in Thailand. And there are certain uh, cultural niceties that she needs to remember unless she's going to give offence. Now, are you used to booing and hissing at villains? Yes? Okay. Every time she does something wrong, I want you to boo and hiss her. And I will give you the sign that she's got it wrong by putting my thumb down like that, all right? And we'll just go through this very brief exercise, and you come out loud and strong with your boos and your hisses when the thumb goes down, and we'll see how a simple encounter of the bringing of a gift can cause trouble. Bob, would you ask her to come in, please? You know, I, I talked about giving victory to the Blue Jays to make me welcome. Andrew still hasn't got me a chair. <laughs> oh, hello, come in. Mr. Harvey gives me... But you see the point I'm making. This can be gravely offensive to folk 
whose natural pattern of life it is. This is part of the stuff of life. And if you're not showing your courtesy and your respect for the individual in these simple ways, then you've immediately built up a barrier and you're not able to share. And misunderstandings of culture can cause offence. Indeed, just a few months ago, there was a classic case in the United States of America where they caused tragedy. A 16-year-old Japanese student, Yoshihiro Hattori, had come to visit with another young man in the United States and it was Halloween and they'd been invited to a Halloween party so they both dressed up and went to find the Halloween party. They came to the house and knocked on the door which seemed fairly quiet for a party house but anyway they knocked on the door and they got the wrong house. The lady of the house came out, asked who they were, saw these young men in odd clothes and was suspicious. She told them to go off and of course the American lad understood. The Japanese didn't, thought she was joking, continued to go towards her and she pulled a shotgun and shot him dead. A complete misunderstanding, unusual of course, but differences of culture and tragedies because of misunderstandings are not unusual. We have to talk very seriously with those who go overseas and with those who return from overseas about culture shock and return culture shock because this is something that is an essential part of life that we need to recognise. So William Carey gives us an example of caring for people and respecting culture. He also at least attempts something that is a task that never leaves us. That is the separation of faith from culture. If we're going to engage in Christian mission and still be sensitive to culture, we must separate what is at the heart of our Christian faith from the fungus growth of our own cultural attitudes. Sometimes we can almost lose what is at the heart of our faith beneath this fungus of our cultural approach. I remember being staggered when I visited one of the more rural parts of Brazil as a keen sportsman to discover that they actually believed it was unchristian to be interested in football and to go to a football... Now this in Brazil, remember? Brazilian football? And in Brazil they thought it was unchristian to be involved in and committed to football. Cultural and yet linked with their faith. We must be honest and admit that in the name of Christ nevertheless we have made some appalling mistakes in the past. In the name of the civilization and the gospel the church has crushed and destroyed peoples and whole cultures. Last year's celebration of the Baptist Missionary Society Bicentenary <laughs> coincided with the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the Caribbean. He went not only as an explorer, remember, but as a missionary. But what he and the conquistadores perpetrated in the Caribbean and in Central and Southern America surely causes us to weep with shame and with horror we see the subjugation of proud peoples and the decimation, the annihilation of folk and the marvellous wealth of culture that they had built up over centuries. And the lack of understanding of culture hasn't ended yet. In a minor way, this was brought home to Moya and myself when we were visiting with fellow Christians, fellow Baptists in mainland Europe. We were offered wine to drink with a meal and said that we didn't drink alcohol. It was accepted at that point, but in a very gracious way, a little later, we were told of how other visitors had come and they had been a little offensive because they too had refused the alcohol, but the wife had worn a full range of cosmetics. And the culture... <laughs> 
that accepted the cosmetics rejected the alcohol and the culture that accepted the alcohol rejected the cosmetics <laughs> both in the name of Christ. In uh, Britain two or three years ago there was a series called The Missionaries. It was meant to be an objective survey of the contemporary missionary situation. It wasn't objective. It was critical. But I have to say it was deservedly critical with one particular episode when I could not believe my eyes. They took you to one particular country in Africa and they showed missionaries of a particular denomination that shall remain nameless. It wasn't Baptist, I'm thankful to say in this instance. But there in the heart of Africa, young folk were being taught to drink afternoon tea, English style. You know how to drink afternoon tea, English style. It's a great cultural asset if you're living in the heart of Africa. <laughs> and this was being done in the name of the church engaged in mission. Mission today demands that we avoid the imposition of culture in the name of Christ. And it's actually a fierce warning to CBIM and BMS, I'm sorry, CBIM, I mustn't say it that way. <laughs> CBIM and BMS and all of us who are involved in mission agencies, we dare not become involved in parallel mission, doing our own thing regardless of and separate from the Christians who are indigenous to that particular place. It's like being involved as active participants in the children's jigsaw puzzle. Have you seen those big puzzles where instead of all of it interlocking, you have little holes and you put the right shaped piece into that particular hole and it will only go into that hole. Being grandparents, we know all about this sort of thing now. <laughs> The thing is, if you don't put the right piece into the right hole, it doesn't fit, and even if it's small enough to go into a bigger, odd-shaped hole, it never touches. It never makes contact. And this is what it is. To be involved in mission, doing it in parallel, ignoring the folk who are our sisters and brothers in Christ in that situation, and never making contact with the people whom we've gone to serve. This can lead to quite foolish mistakes. I visited one situation in Bangladesh in my very early days linked with the BMS and learned of one of our technical missionaries who had been insisting that a building for which he had a responsibility should be put up in the way that he said. Now coming from Britain it was technically right. But he didn't understand the vagaries of the Bangladeshi climate. He'd never lived in a monsoon area before. And when his Bengali workers were telling him, no sir, you can't do it that way, you have to do it this way, you'll do it this way. And they were right and he was wrong and it was shown in the future of the building, which had no future. <laughs> and equally, I have visited another building in another Asian country. And it wasn't inappropriate in the sense that it fell down, but it was totally inappropriate. For there in a country of small villages and an overwhelmingly rural population, there was this magnificent edifice as a training centre for the church. What was it training them for? For the Christian people to continue to minister in the rural situations, the facilities there were totally inappropriate. Now, of course, I have chosen extreme examples. But it's the way in which the less extreme situations creep up upon us and take us over so we do not realise how insensitive we are being culturally that really can create the problem. We must be culturally sensitive and we must separate our faith from the cultural accretions, the, the fungoid growth that covers up our faith and nearly swallows it. We have to go through the painful process of asking, forget about our view of Sunday observance, forget about 
our sets of ethical standards about smoking and alcohol and sex and whatever. What is the gospel? What is the heart of our faith? What is the essence of the good news of God to his people still struggling and striving to find life in all its fullness in Jesus Christ? I think that we see these lessons in Carey. And I believe that we see also something of how we can approach another culture. And we must approach other cultures if we're going to share in God's mission to the whole world, which is to each and every culture and people. And if we're going to approach each and every culture, then we need to identify the culture. We have to discover it as to what it is. That means we have to recognise what's the nature of this people's identity. What actually holds these folk together as a people group? Is it their history? Is it their language? Is it their literature? Is it their art? Is it the music that they have or worship? Is it a common interest they have? Is it a, a, a specific sporting activity? Is it the place where they live? Is it the work that they do? What makes this particular culture? What makes this particular subgroup? What brings together this community of people with ties that binds them incredibly strongly together? What is it that makes this group special? We have to ask those questions. And once we've identified the culture, we need to become as fully as we can part of that culture. Carey was convinced that mission must be incarnational, alongside people, identifying with them always. Again, we learn from that classic book, The Inquiry. He says, the missionaries must be men, now let's be clear, although he said men, even in the earliest days, the total missionary team of the BMS was men and women. The missionaries must be men of great piety, prudence, courage and forbearance. They must be willing to leave all the comforts of life behind them and to encounter the hardships of a torrid or a frigid climate. Yes. <laughs> An uncomfortable manner of living. I may get a chair tomorrow. And, and every other inconvenience that can attend this undertaking. Their first business must be to gain some acquaintance with the language of the natives and by all lawful means to endeavour to cultivate a friendship with them and as soon as possible let them know the errand for which we were there. Carey and his colleagues built on this when they bonded together in the Serampore Covenant and appreciated the tasks that they must undertake. Uh, they said to each other there, it is very important that we should gain all the information we can to know their modes of thinking, their habits, their propensities, their antipathies. It's necessary in our intercourse with the Hindus that as far as we are able, we abstain from those things which would increase their prejudices against the gospel. Those parts of our English manner which are most offensive to them should be kept out of sight as much as possible. A sensitive identification with the people in their culture. Isn't this the same as the Apostle Paul says? You remember? Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Surely, the challenge to our cultural sensitivity and our identification with the people whom we would seek to win 
We've got to be true Baptists here. Don't we believe in total immersion? We need to be immersed in the culture within which we want to share the gospel. On the international scene and at home, and I emphasize and at home, there are no shortcuts. We have to give ourselves wholeheartedly to the learning process, and that means language, behavior, the lot. Let me talk to you about uh, a couple of situations. A friend of Moyers and mine, uh, in his ministerial years, felt a call to one particular subculture, a group, the bikers, you know, the motorbikers. He was keen on motorbikes himself anyway, was Tony, but he worked hard to become part of that group. He, um, he had the right size of motorbike. You couldn't mess around on a 250cc, not with that bunch. It was a thousand or nothing. And you had the leathers, you had the gear, and you didn't wear your helmet because you didn't wear a helmet. That was not on. And you travelled with them and you used their language, at least insofar as a Baptist parson could use their language. <laughs> and you shared in what they did. He told me of how on one occasion there was some very smart fellow in a snazzy sports car who came up behind a bunch of these bikers who were actually travelling very sensibly. But Mr. Sports Car Special zoomed by them and cut in front of them. Not a pleasing thing. <laughs> so, in fact, they just moved as a bunch and surrounded the sports car, half of them in front, half behind, and then, without apparently a signal, they increased speed before and behind. And in no time at all, the sports car was being taken at speeds and in fashion that turned his hair white, or it should have done. <laughs> and Tony was having to be with them. But this is it. He felt he must identify with them by learning their language, by becoming part of them, if he was going to minister to them. And as far as one can measure, it was an effective ministry. The same is true if we identify any group. If I want to go back to Britain and work amongst not the, 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 the sort of nouveau riche pub goers of our time, those who go increasingly because the pub grub, the meals served in our public houses, is often better than you can get in some of the more expensive restaurants. If you forget those and think in terms of those who go for the alcohol and who sit through the evening absorbing pint after pint after pint, you've got to know what the language is there. It's no good my going into that sort of situation and not knowing what it is to take my empty beer pot and turn it upside down on the bar. Without such an understanding of language, I would be out and suffering. And there's no easy way. If it's going to be transnational, crossing the oceans or crossing border boundaries thousands of miles away, the language is essential. An understanding of history is essential. A grasp of literature that the great thoughts of the people of that country is essential. If we're going to begin to understand how they tick, where can folk understand if you come as visitors to Britain, how can you really understand us unless you know something of the heritage of our Shakespeare, of our system of um, justice, uh, of our system that is the Anglican Church. There needs to be the learning lesson. And if you're looking at the local scene, if you're looking at a small subgroup, there's no shortcut. There's got to be the learning process. I'm not simply thinking of migrant groups who have come in and still use a language that is not American English. Rather, I'm thinking of those who are your compatriots and yet are different in their cultural approaches and groupings. When we have identified the culture, identified with the culture, then I believe at last we may become and we may offer God's good news within that culture. 
Even when we're doing this, we have to know there is no single or simple gospel. When we look at the life of Jesus, wherever he went, whomever he met, he was always gospel, he was always good news. But what a difference in the encounters. For some, he was a healing hand. For the leprosy victims, he was a cleansing power. For the woman taken in adultery, he was a forgiving voice and spirit and a renewing one as he sent her away. For the Pharisees, those who felt in a sense the harshness of his tongue, nevertheless, he was a cleansing, renewing good news. And we have to discover what particular gem or gems from the marvellous wealth of the gospel is really the appropriate message for that group with whom we're working. We can't just hit them with half a dozen proof texts. We can't hit them with a set formula. And I have to say we must be wary of those formulae which say that we can win folk wherever if we follow this pattern and these six or seven steps. That is to deny what I believe is the God-given gift of culture and language and heritage. We need to discover what is God's word for them. And then we shall share in cross-cultural mission. Not transcultural, but cross with a big C, the cross of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Because in some way or another, the message of the cross will be speaking to their situation. Now which particular aspect of the cross's message, we have to discover. But there will be that word from God, based on his saving work in the death and resurrection of our Lord. This is an opportunity that comes as we identify the culture and identify with the culture. We may discover God's word and then be it, share it. But of course, mission and culture is not all that easy, is it? <coughs> Carrie certainly trod that particular path. But there are some aspects of cultural life that are so far removed from God's will that they can be met in only one way, and that is confrontation. Carey, once he'd arrived in India, quickly discovered some practices that he felt were so different from God's will and way as to be totally abhorrent to God. You didn't identify with such things, you opposed them. You'll know something of his story, perhaps. You'll know how at that time in India there was the caste system with its carefully aligned classes that meant that men and women in the lower classes were second class humans, not just second class citizens. And as far as the outcasts were concerned, they were so low as to be beyond the system. They were trash and worthless. Now into this situation, Carey genuinely brought the light of a transformation. He confronted the culture, and as men and women were one to faith, they were accepted into a church which refused to perpetuate the caste system. Read the story. They went to the Lord's table together. The missionaries from Britain and the Indians, some outcasts, they went to the table of the Lord together. They worshipped and they served their Lord together. It created all sorts of problems because those who had come to faith, generally speaking, were thrown out by their families. They were made outcasts. They became the, the trash in Indian eyes at the bottom of the pile. And that meant that Carey and colleagues were looking to finding homes for these folk, giving education to the children, establishing work possibilities helping them to begin what was a whole new way of life because they'd been thrown out. But throughout it all, there was the maintenance that here were God's children, much loved and equally accepted. Carey opposed, of course, infanticide, which was one of the running sores on India's face and which Carey tried to meet with healing. The children, particularly girls, 
were felt not important and drowned to spare the expense on a poor family's budget. Other lives were taken as part of religious celebrations, sacrifices. The most famous of all of Carey's campaigns was against Sati, the burning, of a a burning alive of widows on their husband's funeral pyre. One day, William Carey saw it for himself firsthand. He was down by the river Hoogley, and there was the woman, the funeral pyre, the crowd. In his own words, I exhorted the widow not to throw her life, to fear nothing, for no evil would follow her refusal to be burned. But in the most calm manner she mounted the pile and danced on it with her hands extended as if in the utmost tranquility of spirit. Previous to this, those whose office it was to set fire to the pile led her six times round it, thrice at a time. As she went round, she scattered sweetmeats amongst the people who ate them as a very holy thing. This being ended, she lay down beside the corpse and put one arm under its neck and the other over it. When a quantity of dry cocoa leaves and other substances were heaped over them to a considerable height and then ghee, melted butter, was poured on the top, two bamboos were then put over them, held down fast and fire put to the pile which immediately blazed very fiercely owing to the dry and combustible materials of which it was composed. No sooner was the fire kindled than all the people set up a great shout of joy invoking Siva. It was impossible to have heard the woman had she groaned or even cried aloud. She died. Carey could only confront such a culturally acceptable practice. And from that day he waged a campaign. He wrote letters. He urged the government. He struggled to stop this senseless waste of life that was usually young life. When at last, towards the end of his time in India, the law was actually issued banning Sati, the message reached him on a Sunday. He was due to preach, and you know how much she was keen to preach the gospel. But all the same, he got someone else to preach in his place so that he could translate the new law in, from English into the language of the people so that not one more woman should die in this fashion. Some aspects of culture we cannot identify with. In God's name and for the sake of humanity, we need to confront them. And those challenges that faced Carey today, uh, in his day haven't disappeared entirely. But we have to look to similar challenging situations that we encounter. There are some issues, gender, race, age, and others that we'll pick up a little later in the last lecture. But there is a fundamental approach to a whole culture which Leslie Newbegin has alerted us to. He and others have pointed to the way in which the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason has made a huge difference in human consciousness and approach. He recognises that it led to the conversion of the intellectual leadership of Europe to a new faith, one dependent upon science and rationalism, one which removed the gospel from public life, leaving it only the private world of home and chapel. Newbegin says that this powerful ideology which has neutered the churches in Europe is now, under the name of modernization, the dominant force in most of the world. We see the extreme claim of this scientific worldview in that immensely successful book by the physicist Stephen Hawking, A Brief History of Time. He concludes his book if we find the answer to that, this search that he's been talking of, if we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason. For then we should know the mind of God. 
Hawking doesn't believe that there is a God and it's the claim of arrogance. Here is the arrogance which asserts that science is the only final agreed truth of our time. Surely in all conscience we cannot accept or condone such a view. Continually, constantly, the task of Christians is to confront such a view which undermines the whole of our Western culture. We have to point to the supreme worth of that which cannot be quantified, cannot be measured, cannot be discovered by scientific research. And more than that, we have to question the whole basis of knowing that is implied by a book like Stephen Hawking's, of knowing, of discerning, of absorbing, of living what is genuine truth. Is truth only to be found in the methods of the scientists, in the observable, the measurable, the analyzable? Or do we not assert that there is the most fundamental truth of life that we can only know by faith? That humble, tremulous, terrified leap of trust which is at the heart of all true relationship. And in addition to faith, no truth only by love, that fulfillment of the most perfect of life's potential, by the losing of ourselves in being loved and by loving. What was it that our Lord said? Life is more than food and the body, more than clothes. Your Father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. We must lose life and the material things of life to find life. Are we really going to leave to the advocates of scientism and modernism the most precious things in life? Or are we going to confront, confront the underlying culture and say that at the heart of life there is not science and reason alone. At the heart of life there is faith, there is love, there is personality, and we discover it in our Saviour and Lord Jesus Christ. And if we do this, are we going to engage also in the battle with that concomitant of scientism, the hanger-on, the camp follower of modernism, the divorce of the private life from the public morality. You see, if the ultimate truth is to be found in the enlightenment of science, then of course individuals are left free to their individual faith and morals, but it has nothing to do with anybody else, and it certainly has nothing to do with public life. And this understanding is what is evidenced by some of the scandals that certainly have hit our British press and media in the last 12 months. You may have picked up some of them. Captains of industry, cabinet ministers, the royal family. And you know how dirty linen has been washed and aired in public with respect to all of these. Now, I'm not in any way condoning the paparazzi approach which brings out into the public things which should be left private. But there is in so much of this the underlying assumption that you can separate private life and public morality. It doesn't really matter what you are and what you do, provided you keep a good face of doing the right thing so far as the public is concerned. And the true disaster is not what you are or what you're doing, it's the fact that you're found out. And this, for Britain anyway, is part of our public life. No wonder that Dr Carey, not William this time, the other Dr Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, no wonder that that Dr. Carey said only a few weeks ago that adulterers could not be trusted in his scathing attack, attack on public figures who commit adultery. The Archbishop said the person who systematically deceives his or her spouse financially or sexually 
is not likely to escape the downward spiral of deception in other parts of life. You can't trust them. It's part of life. And you cannot separate the one from the other. We need to confront this understanding. And it may be that you will recognise areas in Canadian life that in Christ's name you must confront. On the British scene, I would add the incredible emphasis on the profit motive, where the most important thing is to make a profit. And we have a soaring number of unemployed whose lives are belittled and demeaned and limited, whose marriages are under great pressure, whose families are suffering because of their joblessness. And they are jobless, many of them, because the profit motive has become supreme. We need to challenge and confront such, such issues in Christ's name. So where does all of this take us? Well, like Carey, it takes us into voyages of discovery. For him, it was following the path of Captain Cook. For us, where shall we find a guide? Well, we may learn from some of those who point to the difference between faith and culture, but for ourselves, I think it can be a very exciting discovery. You know, we really can have the marvellous joy of unpeeling faith and discovering what is the kernel, the heart of the gospel. Let, let's lose our trappings. Some of them may come back. Some of them may be right to hold on to. But we have the particular joy of discovering what is the kernel of the gospel, the heart of our faith. And as soon as we realise that, it will become an even brighter jewel for us and we'll realise how little the jewel has been illuminating the lives of others. We'll recognise how many unreached groups there are. I'm not a betting man. But if I were, I'm not, somebody laugh, I'm not a betting man. But if I were, I would wager that in this campus of 3,000 odd students, there are groups, there are cultures, centering around a particular club or a particular sporting activity or a particular place of meeting, and they've got their own language, and they've got their own in-jokes, and they've got their own timetable and calendar, and I would say that here we have opportunity in Acadia alone of discovering areas where we may identify, identify with, discover God's word for, and then have the joy of sharing. And not only here, of course, but wherever we are and wherever we come from, we have the openness to receive God's word for this sharing of the word and then for confronting, where necessary, the cultures that are alien to what is at the heart of our God's loving purposes. Culture and confrontation. Yes, that wasn't the whole truth for Carey, and it's not the whole truth for us. Culture and the cross's word for an individual culture, that's part of the truth. But culture and the cross's condemnation of aspects, that also is part of the truth that I believe we learn from William Carey. Thank you.